Welcome to lecture number 19. Today I will explain some natural splittings for global functors if you evaluate them at orthogonal groups, unitary groups and symplectic groups. In the next lecture I will then give you some applications of these splittings. The splittings applied to the global functors you get from global spectra will tell you that certain long exact homotopy group sequences actually decompose into short exact sequences. This, in turn, will have consequences for equivalent Euler classes in the global tone spectra, capital M, capital O, and capital M, capital U, that I talked about in lecture 10. Another application of today's splitting will be stable global splittings of the suspension spectra of certain global classifying spaces. But today I will just develop the theory and tell you about splittings of global functors at orthogonal, unitary, and symplectic groups. To put things into context, I would like to begin with a result that is more than 60 years old and that is due to Nakaoka. This is the same Japanese mathematician that already came up when I discussed symmetric product spectra, so he had done cohomological calculations of the filtration spectra in the symmetric product. So here's a different result of Nakaoka. So the result says that for all n greater or equal to 1 and all abelian groups A, the restriction map in group cohomology from the cohomology of the nth symmetric group with coefficients in this abelian group A down to the cohomology of the previous symmetric group, sigma n minus 1 into A, this is a split epimorphism. So to fix notation and terminology, let me quickly say what I mean by group cohomology. So if G is a group, discrete, and A is an abelian group, then by group cohomology, there are two equivalent things you could mean by it. So if you're more topologically inclined, as most of the people who are watching these lectures probably are, you could take this to be the singular cohomology of a classifying space of G with coefficients in A. This definition even makes sense for topological groups, in particular for compact Lie groups. If you're more algebraically inclined, you might want to think of a different definition. Then this is the X groups over the group ring of G with between two trivial modules, so Z in the first variable and this abelian group A in the second variable, and in both of these the group acts trivial. So you can choose which definition you want to work with. Nakaoka's paper was published in the Annals, and I would like to motivate why it's actually a surprising result, why it might not be completely obvious that such a splitting holds. So let me give you two examples that will illustrate that, of course, in general, if you have a subgroup of a bigger group, and then you look at the restriction homomorphism in singular cohomology or in group cohomology, there's, of course, absolutely no reason to expect that, in general, this map would be subjective. Here's a simple example. So let's take as the big group the cyclic group with four elements. Elements 1, t, t squared, and t cubed, and t to the 4 is the identity. And then let's take the cyclic group with two elements, so the unique two element subgroup containing 1 and t squared. And then you can look at the restriction from this C4 to this subgroup, going from the first group cohomology of C4 with coefficients in Z mod 2 to the first cohomology of C2 with coefficients in Z mod 2, and this is not subjective. How can you see that? Well, in general, H1 of G with coefficients in A is isomorphic to just the group homomorphisms from G into A. And this, of course, because A is abelian, will always factor over the abelianization. These two examples are abelian, so that doesn't make a difference. Um, on the other hand, the unique isomorphism between the cyclic group of order 2 and the group Z mod 2 does not extend to C4. So 
So in this particular example, both of these are actually non-zero, they're abstractly isomorphic, they're cyclic groups of order two, but the map is the zero map. Now you might think, well, this is sort of one very special example, and you know, this is a whole family of groups. Does is such a result to be expected for related infinite families of groups? And the next example will illustrate that it's something very special going on with the symmetric groups. Inside of the nth symmetric group sits an index 2 subgroup, a normal subgroup, the alternating group. And as the n varies, all these alternating groups form an infinite family that have very much of a similar structure as the symmetric group structures. In particular, one alternating group embeds into the next one and their restriction homomorphisms. And for the alternating groups, these maps are not in general subjective. So a particular example is that if you go by a restriction from the alternating group of order 4m plus 2, so from some dimension that is congruent to 2 mod 4 to the one below, to 4m plus 1, in group cohomology with mod 2 coefficients, a 4m plus 2 f2 coefficients to h star of a 4m plus 1 with f2 coefficients. This is not subjective. The map is also not in general subjective in all the other dimensions. For example, you can use cohomology with other coefficients to rule out those possibilities. So this is illustrating that something very special must be going on with the symmetric groups because already for such closely related families um, you don't have the splitting results. Two years after Nakaoka's paper appeared, Dolt published a different argument, also in a paper in the Annals. Dolt's proof is extremely relevant and it makes it crystal clear what exactly is the structure that is necessary to make this work. Dolt's result actually works uh, not just for group cohomology, but very much more generally, namely it works for thin global functors. So this is the version of global functors where the indexing category is not all compact Lie groups, but only finite groups. As I explained in the lecture where I first introduced global functors, if you're only interested in finite groups, then thin global functors can be described completely algebraically. For example, you can define them as these biset functors where you have inflation, restriction, and transfers, but not necessarily deflations. So Joel Doyle's paper essentially proves the following theorem. So now we let f be a thin global functor. and n greater than or equal to 1. Then the restriction homomorphism restriction from sigma n to sigma n minus 1, which goes from the value of the global functor at the nth symmetric group to the value of the global functor at the n minus first symmetric group, is a naturally split epimorphism. Naturality is in the f variable, so if you have a transformation of thin global functors, then the splitting will be natural for that. Before I prove this, I want to make a bunch of comments about the result. The first comment is, of course, that group cohomology is a special case of this. This is something I would mentioned earlier. So much more generally, if you have a generalized cohomology theory, then you can evaluate it at the non-equivalent classifying spaces of all compact Lie groups. And this is even a global functor, where the functoriality comes from the functoriality of the classified space construction, and the transfers come from the becker gottlieb transfer. If you're only interested in finite groups and only interested in singular cohomology or group cohomology, there's of course a much simpler, much easier way to see this structure, because group cohomology is contravariantly functorial in arbitrary homomorphisms of finite groups, and the transfers are just the transfers in singular cohomology that come from finite sheeted coverings. So there's a way more direct approach to see this if you're a topologist. And also if you're an algebraist, then if you only restrict to finite groups and the restriction homomorphisms come from restrictions of the group rings, 
And the transfers can also be defined entirely in terms of homological algebra. So for the special case, you don't need this huge machinery of equivalent topology to convince yourself that group cohomology in a fixed dimension and for a fixed coefficient group is an example of a thin global functor. Because thin global functors can be defined and studied purely algebraically, and in fact have been studied quite a bit in the algebraic literature, but then usually under the name of biset functors, I would not be surprised if this result were somewhere in the algebraic literature on biset functors. However, I have looked for it and I am not aware of an explicit reference. The final comment is that for some small numbers of n, you can get this natural splitting in a different way. So this is a remark. The standard embeddings for small n from sigma 0 into sigma 1, sigma 1 into sigma 2, sigma 2 into sigma 3, and finally sigma 3 into sigma 4. They have retractions by group homomorphisms. So this is even an isomorphism, both of these groups are trivial. This is the trivial group, so there's only one homomorphism in the other direction. Here the retraction is the sign, and here it's maybe a little bit uh, less well known. This comes from the fact that sigma 4 has this exceptional normal subgroup that's abstractly isomorphic to Z2 cross Z2, and the quotient is isomorphic to sigma 3. This section is not unique, but it's unique up to conjugacy. If you choose a retraction by a continuous group homomorphism, then in any global functor you have the associated inflation homomorphism, which will, of course, split this, rest this restriction map. So for small values of n, there is a much more direct proof, which only uses the functoriality in restriction along group homomorphisms. Not just to subgroups, but also inflations, but it does not use the transfer functoriality. In the general argument, you cannot proceed like this, because as soon as n is 5 or larger, the inclusion of sigma n minus 1 into n does not have a retraction by a group homomorphism, so you cannot split this just by arguing with the inflation. Instead, Doyle's argument that I will soon present makes essential use of transfers, so it's really using the full global structure that is available. Another word of warning, in the small cases, in the small dimensions, the splitting you get from choosing these retractions will be different from the splittings that will be produced in general, except at the very small cases n1 and 2. So for this example and for this example, the retractions also give you natural splittings, but they definitely give you different natural splittings from the ones that ha happen in the whole family of symmetric groups. As you can probably guess, you will not find this exact statement in Dold's paper. Dold only deals with group cohomology, because at that time neither the topologists nor the algebraists had formalized this notion of global functors, not even in the special case of finite groups. Nevertheless, Dold's argument really only used exactly this structure, and that is why I'm giving him credit for the result. Here's the proof. We first define an auxiliary, auxiliary abelian group, and that will be the summons and the splitting. So we define f of sigma semicolon k, so f is the global functor. Sigma refers to the fact that we're right now looking at the families of symmetric groups, and k is a non-negative integer. I define this as the kernel of the restriction homomorphism, of the restriction from sigma k to sigma k minus 1 from f of sigma k to f of sigma k minus 1. So in some sense, this is the part that essentially lives at the kth step. And then we define a natural isomorphism from the direct sum over k from 0 all the way up to n from this relative term f sigma semicolon k to the value at the largest one, sigma n, so that is this n that the sum runs up to. And this will be a sum of maps that I call psi k n. So psi k n is the one on the kth summit. 
And the map will be such that when you here let the sum only go to n minus 1, then this will be exactly this isomorphism and then restrict it down. So with the proof, we will also show that this particular map is a natural split epimorphism. It will come out of the proof. The convention here is that f of sigma, comma, 0 is just the value of the trivial group. In this particular situation, the f sigma, comma, 1 is actually always 0 because sigma 1 and sigma 0 are both trivial groups. So that particular restriction isomorphism is always an isomorphism. So one of the sum ends is always 0. Nevertheless, I want to give a systematic argument and I want to give an approach that also works later for orthogonal and unitary groups. Of course, O of 1 and U of 1 are not trivial groups, which is why I'm not exploiting this fact that one of the sum ends is actually always 0 in this special situation. Okay, let me define all these maps, Psi Kn here. Psi Kn is defined as the following composite. So we start with f of sigma k. This was defined as the kernel of the restriction homomorphism. So it includes into the value at sigma k. Now we're going to use an inflation p k n minus k upper star to the global functor evaluated at sigma k cross sigma n minus k. So here p k n minus k is a group homomorphism from sigma k cross sigma n minus k to sigma k. This is the projection onto the first factor. And then we're going to use a transfer map that I just denote by transfer k, comma, n minus k all the way up to sigma n. So transfer k, n minus k is the transfer along the block sum embedding or the sum embedding from sigma k cross sigma n minus k into sigma n. So it's convenient here to abuse notation to some extent. I am already interpreting sigma k minus 1 as a subgroup of sigma k, and you've probably all had the same interpretation in mind, the one that I intended. Of course, by this I mean the subgroup that fixes the last element. And also the product sigma k times sigma n minus k can naturally be identified with the block subgroup of sigma n, the one that takes the elements 1 up to k. Uh, leaves those invariant and that leaves k plus 1 up to m invariant. And this is the sum invariant. So it's going to be convenient to slightly abuse the notation, otherwise uh, it's going to get overly complicated. This is already the end of the definition. I have defined each of the psi kn's and that's what the case sum is on this direct sum. And now what remains to be shown is that this actually is an isomorphism. And this depends crucially on one property that these maps have, that they are compatible in a very precise sense if you let the k and the n vary. And the claim is that if I restrict from sigma n to sigma n minus 1 after doing psi k comma n, then this is equal to psi k comma n minus 1. And both of these are homomorphisms from f of sigma comma k to f evaluated at sigma n minus 1. This compatibility property is something that we will have of exactly the same form later when I do the orthogonal group case, the unitary group case, and the symplectic group case. And this is the key relation that makes everything tick. The proof of this key relation exploits a particular double coset formula for two subgroups of sigma n namely the subgroup sigma n minus 1 on the one hand side and this block sum subgroup on the other side. So we have to identify how many double cosets in sigma n there are for these particular subgroups. The first observation is if we take sigma n left orbits by sigma n minus 1, this as a set is bijects with a set of numbers 1 up to n and this bijection takes the coset of a permutation and evaluates it as the last element n. And then on this, the action of sigma k cross sigma n minus k is the one that we used to embed it. So the sigma k permutes the first k elements, and this permutes the last n minus k elements. 
And this action visibly has two orbits. And that means after we form the double coset, so first the left quotient here and then the right quotient here, we exactly get two points. And that means the double coset formula has exactly two signs. So we can write it out as follows. If I take the transfer from sigma k cross sigma n minus k up to sigma n, and then I restrict from sigma n to sigma n minus 1, I should get two summons. Then I have to choose representatives of the two double cosets. One clever choice is always to choose the identity. If we take the identity, that's one of the two double cosets. We have to restrict this down to sigma n minus 1. So that gives us the term restriction from sigma k cross sigma n minus k. Intersecting it with sigma n minus 1 gets us to sigma k cross sigma n minus k minus 1. And then we have to transfer up from sigma k times sigma n minus k minus 1 all the way up to sigma n minus 1. The convenient choice of representative for the second double coset is the transposition that interchanges k and n, so always the last points in the two orbits. Um, the summit we get there, so now we have to restrict from sigma k, sigma n minus k, and intersect it with the conjugate of sigma n minus 1, and then we get the following term. This gives us the restriction from sigma k cross sigma n minus k to sigma k minus 1 cross sigma n minus k. So now we are sort of going down in the first factor, and that's because the transposition of n and k has moved the k and the n to each other, and then we transfer up from there, transfer from sigma k minus 1 cross sigma n minus k to sigma n minus 1. So that was an easy instance of the double coset formula. And what we were exploiting here, let me write this down explicitly, we use that if we take sigma n minus 1, embedded as a subgroup that fixes the last element n, and we intersect it with a conjugate by the transposition kn of sigma k cross sigma n minus k, then we get the subgroup of sigma n minus 1 that in our abuse notation would be sigma k minus 1 cross sigma n minus k. So that's used in the identification of the second summit. Okay, so now when we want to evaluate psi k n and then the restriction, exactly the last two things we'll have to do is exactly this transfer and then restricting down. So what we're now going to do, we take this double coset formula and we pre-compose it with these two maps. So now we pre-compose the double coset formula with the composite of these two things. So with p k n minus k upper star after the inclusion. What do we get? Well, on the left-hand side, we get exactly the restriction from psi from sigma n to sigma n minus 1 after psi k n, because that's exactly if we take all of this and then restrict down. And now we have to take the sum of these two terms and compose on the right with this and this. So let me spell it out what we're getting. So we get, first of all, the transfer from sigma k cross sigma n minus k minus 1 to sigma n, composed with the restriction from sigma k cross sigma n minus k to sigma k cross sigma n minus k minus 1, composed with p k n minus k upper star, composed with the inclusion. The other summit is similar, but not exactly the same. This is the transfer from sigma k minus 1 cross sigma n minus k up to sigma n. So the difference is where the n minus 1 is. Here is the minus 1 is in the second factor, and here the minus 1 is in the first factor. After restriction from sigma k cross sigma n minus k all the way down to sigma k minus 1 cross sigma n minus k after p k n minus k upper star and the inclusion. And now I'm claiming that this is exactly psi k minus 1 and this term is 0. A 
an instance of the double coset formula allowed us to rewrite the left hand side of the claim as the sum of two terms and I've copied the two terms here and here. Now we're going to take care of these two terms one by one. Let's start with the upper one. So the first transfer I just copied, transfer from sigma k cross sigma n minus k minus 1 up to sigma n minus 1 after. And now here we are restricting along the projection to the first factor and then we are restricting down and in the first factor nothing changes. So the composite is also an inflation along the projection to the first factor but where the second index has dropped by 1. So the composite of these two restrictions is pk and now n minus k minus 1 upper star and then we do nothing to the inclusion. But this is exactly the definition of psi k n minus 1. So the first sum gives us the term here that we want to have. Something similar but not exactly the same happens with this second sum. We're going to copy the transfer. Transfer from sigma k minus 1 cross sigma n minus k to sigma n minus 1. And now here's a similar situation, but it's not exactly the same. So we're first inflating along the projection to the first factor, but now we're going down in the first factor, not in the second factor. And that is exactly the same as if we had first restricted from sigma k to sigma k minus 1, and then done the analogous inflation, but then with the index dropped here by 1. So in other words, this composite of these two restriction nets can be rewritten as p k minus 1 comma n minus k upper star followed with the restriction from sigma k to sigma k minus 1 after the inclusion. But now we're done because we are starting at f sigma comma k we're including and then we're restricting down but this was exactly defined as the kernel of the restriction. So these two maps by definition, the composite of these two maps by definition of this term is zero, and hence the whole term is zero, and this provides the proof of the claim. So we see in this argument, and that's going to be relevant again later when we do this for orthogonal and unitary groups, that it made a huge difference in which of the two factors we restricted to the adjacent symmetric group one further down. If we restrict it down in the second factor, we just got the previous psi. If we restrict it down in the first factor, we got zero. Now we can complete the proof. It's now relatively easy. So the first thing we have to convince ourselves is that this relation also holds for k equals zero. But for k equals zero, it just holds by inspection because all of these are inflation maps and there's not really any transfer happening. So now we can prove Dolet's argument by induction on n. So there's nothing to show for n equals 0. Because f of k, comma 0 was defined at the value at the trivial group, which is also the value at sigma 0. So now we can assume that n is greater or equal to 1. Now we can consider a diagram of abelian groups as follows. So here I'm going to write down a split exact sequence, f sigma semicolon n, mapping via the inclusion as one of the summits into the direct sum from k equals 0 all the way up to n of f of sigma comma k. So this is the inclusion as the top sum end. And here I'm projecting away from the top sum end, going to the sum where k already ends at n minus 1 and not at n, f of sigma semicolon k, and then to the zero. And this sequence is definitely exact. By design, it's a standard split exact sequence. Let's compare this to what we are really after. So here we have the map sum over all the psi k n's going to the value at sigma n. We would like to show this map as an isomorphism. So let me copy here f of sigma n comma n. And here this is going to be also the inclusion. And here I have zero. So this diagram commutes here and that's just the fact which you can directly check that psi n comma n is actually the same as the inclusion. Now if you unravel this there's no inflation happening for n n and there's no transfer happening so it's just the inclusion. That makes this little square commute. Here I put restriction from sigma n to sigma n minus 1 
to f of sigma n minus 1. Here I put the sum of the psi k n minus 1. And then this diagram computes, that's exactly the claim that this computes. Now we will argue by induction. So the first sequence is exact. It's a standard split exact sequence. What about the lower sequence? Well, this is an inclusion. It's injective. That's the exactness at this spot. At this spot, the lower sequence is also exact by definition because this term was defined at the kernel of this restriction map. The thing that's crucial and not a priori clear is what about exactness at this spot? In other words, why is this subjective? But we are in an inductive argument, and this is an isomorphism by induction. Since this map is clearly subjective, it's a projection, and this is an isomorphism, we can conclude that this map is also subjective, so the lower sequence is also exact. And then the five lemma tells us we have an equality here, an isomorphism here, so we can conclude that this is also an isomorphism, and that is what we wanted to have. At the same time, we have made a splitting explicit, and we've also shown that this restriction map is a naturally split epimorphism because this isomorphism is natural, so you can invert it, and here you can do the inclusion into the larger sum, and then you can go down with this isomorphism. So all the way around here is a natural splitting. Of course, the splitting is not very explicit, and this is in some sense a kind of the charm or of the magic that's going on here, that because of this, by this inductive argument, we are producing a natural splitting, but it's not completely obvious in easy terms what the splitting actually is. This is the end of the proof of Doyle's theorem. The motivating example of this theorem is, of course, when f is group cohomology, and then we get Nakaoka's theorem back. Here's another fun example of this. We can now show the following. So let m be a smooth, closed, sigma n manifold. Then m is sigma n equivalently important to a smooth closed sigma n plus one manifold. How do we get this? Well, we apply this to a specific global functor. Take f to be the bordism global functor of the dimension of the manifold. Suppose the manifold is n-dimensional, and you let this vary. So this is the collection of mth g-equivalent bordism groups for g running over all finite groups. And this has exactly a thin global functor functoriality. On the one hand side, you can just restrict actions along homomorphisms between finite groups, that is the restriction functoriality, and the transfer functoriality is by inducing up along an inclusion of subgroups. Here it is kind of important that we are really restricting our attention to finite groups, because if we wanted uh, compact Lie groups in the picture and the dimension goes up, then the transfer mixes different dimensions and it's not exactly going to work out this way. On the other hand, if we wanted a full global functor, then we could pass to the Tom spectrum that represents this on finite groups, where I refer to lectures number 8 and 9. So this is an example of a thin global functor. If you apply Dodd's theorem to this, you get this conclusion that every sigma n manifold smooth closed is sigma n equivalently bordered to the underlying sigma n manifold of a sigma n plus 1 manifold. I have no idea if this particular example is in any way interesting. It might just be a curiosity, but I think it's a nice illustration. If I didn't know about Doyle's theorem, I would not have any idea how we actually prove this, how you construct the manifold that is underlying this. And the argument for Doyle's theorem that I presented was actually constructive. So it's a little bit better. There's actually a construction in terms of summing up, taking transfers and inflations of how you can construct this manifold that it's bordered to. In the rest of the lecture, I would like to convince you that the splitting has an analog for orthogonal groups, unitary groups, and symplectic groups. 
Those splitting results are actually new, and the reference is this recent preprint of myself. There are also the special orthogonal groups and the special unitary groups. So these are to the orthogonal and unitary groups a little bit what the alternating groups are to the symmetric groups. And for the special orthogonal and special unitary groups, there is no such splitting, at least not in the same way. I will briefly return to that at the end of the lecture. In the case of orthogonal, unitary, and symplectic groups, we of course need a full global functor. It's not enough to have one only defined on finite groups. The argument will actually only use the values and products of orthogonal groups, but I cannot really imagine how this extra generality is useful, because all the examples I can think of come from global spectra, and then you're going to have the global functor on all compact Lie groups anyhow. Besides the fact that we now have to look at full global functors, there is another complication that makes the story a little bit more subtle in the orthogonal case, unitary case, and symplectic case. Namely, a key ingredient was this double coset formula, and that's going to be more interesting or more complicated now. For the rest of the lecture, I will concentrate on the case of orthogonal groups. The arguments for unitary and symplectic groups are completely parallel. At the heart of the matter, we will need the double coset formula for specific subgroups of OM. Namely, for the subgroups O of n minus 1 and O of k cross O of n minus k inside O of n. And again, I'm going to refuse mutation, and I think we will all agree on the same things. I consider O n minus 1 as a subgroup of O of n by plugging a 1 in the lower right corner. And this is the block sum subgroup where you have a k times k matrix in the upper left and an n minus k times n minus k matrix in the lower right corner. We have had a full lecture on the double coset formula in the generality of compact Lie groups. That was lecture 4, so we're no longer afraid of this. And here's what we have to show. Let f be a global functor, and now this is a full global functor. And then we have 1 less than or equal to k less than or equal to n. And then the double coset formula comes out as follows. And if we transfer from O k times O n minus k to O n, and then we restrict from O n to O n minus 1, well, we're going to get a sum of terms. The first term is maybe the expected one the transfer to O of n minus 1 from O of k cross O of n minus k minus 1 after a restriction from O of k cross O of n minus k to O of k cross O of n minus k minus 1. And then there's a term that we didn't have in the example of the symmetric groups. And this term will be minus the transfer from O of k minus 1 cross O of n minus k minus 1 to O of n minus 1. So this is a term where in both of the groups we have dropped the index by 1 after restriction from O of k cross O of n minus k, O of k minus 1 cross O of n minus k minus 1. And then we'll have a third term, which is again one that does have an analog in the symmetric group case. And that's the transfer from O of k minus 1 cross O of n minus k to O of n minus 1 after restriction O of k cross O of n minus k to O of k minus 1 cross O of n minus k. So this term didn't show up before. And the difference between the three terms is that here we're dropping the index in the second factor, here we're dropping the index in the first factor, and here we're dropping the index in both of these factors. The proof of the double coset formula will show why this third term now shows up that wasn't present in the case of the symmetric groups. So let's prove this. So we have to identify the double coset space, and in this case it's not going to be discrete anymore, and we have to identify the orbital stratification of this. So I claim 
that the double coset space O of n minus 1 on the one hand side, O n and O of k cross O of n minus k on the other side is a closed interval. So after a discrete space, this is kind of the second most complicated thing that could come up. It's not too difficult and we will be able to handle this. So how do we see that this double coset space is an interval? Well, we can first of all analyze orbits on the left by O n minus 1 first. And we know we get there, we just get a sphere. So O n minus 1 modulo O n, this homogeneous space, is homeomorphic to the unit sphere in R to the n by the homeomorphism that sends a coset O n minus 1 times a matrix to just the action of a matrix on the last unit vector. And under this homeomorphism, the right action of OK times ON minus K becomes the tautological right action on here. And then again, we're sort of getting two types of orbits, but not really. So now we have to analyze what kind of isotropic groups come up under the action of O of K times O of N minus K. And now if we're given a point, given a point X from X1 up to XK and then XK plus 1, up to xn, then the first k things are going to be moved inside of themselves by the OK action. The second, uh, the last part of the coordinates will be moved by the On minus k action. And one of the things that's going to be invariant under the action of this subgroup is the length of these two vectors. So the length, the length of this one vector, O1 up to OK, and of the remaining vector, and of O K plus 1 up to N are invariant under the action of this subgroup. And I claim that this is actually the only invariant, and indeed any such X, any such X is in the O of K times O of n minus k orbit of a point of the following form. You know, this is a k-tuple of elements and you can use O of k to move it all the first coordinates to zero and then the last coordinate will have to be the length. So you're going to get a vector of the form 0, 0, 0 and then some t. This is the kth slot. And you can use the n minus k action to do the same game with the last coordinates. You can make all these ones up to zero, except possibly the last, so 0, 0, 0. But then the total vector is a unit vector, so the last coordinate necessarily has to be 1 minus the square root of 1 minus t squared. So these are particular representatives of the OK times O n minus k orbits acting on the sphere here. And so that means the only invariant, and exactly the full invariant, is this t, and that is a number in the closed interval between 0 and 1. And this identifies uh, the double coset space with an interval. A more precise formulation of the analysis of the previous whiteboard is as follows. The map from the closed interval 0, 1 to O of n minus 1 mod O of n mod O of k times O of n minus k, sending t to the double coset of O of n minus 1 times gamma of t times O of k times O of n minus k is a homeomorphism. where gamma sends a number in the unit interval to an orthogonal matrix, and we can take this one. We will take the identity matrix of size k minus 1, 0, 0, 0, and we take 0, um, square root of 1 minus t squared, 0 minus t, and we take 0, 0, the identity matrix of size n minus k minus 1, 0, and here we take 0, t, 0, square root of 1 minus t. 
T squared. So this is a matrix in the orthogonal group because all rows and columns are unit vectors and they're pairwise orthogonal to each other. Now we have to identify the stabilizer groups that come up and let's do this right now. So under the identification of the left coset space, um, the coset of gamma of t corresponds to, well, they, we were taking the last row of the matrix, so this corresponds to the element in the unit sphere that looks like this, square root 1 minus t squared, well this is the kth coordinate and this is the nth coordinate, and now we have to investigate what is the stabilizer group of this element in the unit sphere of r to the n under the action of that group, and that you can directly read off. So this has stabilizer, has stabilizers inside O of k times O of n minus k as follows. Well, it's going to be different whether we have t equal 0 or t equal 1, because then it's a degenerate case. If t is equal to 0, then we have a 0 here, and everything in the first group can stabilize it, but here you have one condition. So in that case, we get O of k cross O of n minus k minus 1, and then let me write cross 1 to indicate that you have to have a 1 in the lower right corner. Then there's sort of the generic case, that's when t is in the open interval 0, 1, then both of these things are non-zero, and the only matrices that can stabilize it is an O of k minus 1 here, and O of n minus k minus 1 here. So there's the stabilizer group is O of k minus 1 cross 1, cross O of n minus k minus 1, cross 1. And then the last situation where it's where t equals 1, then there's a 1 here, so here we get only O k minus 1, cross 1, but then the last coordinate is 0, so in the last form we can get the entire O of n. This is cross O of n, entire O of n minus k here. So that means that the orbital stratification, orbital decomposition of the interval is as the point 0, union the open interval, union the point 1. And that means that we have three terms in the double coset formula. The term corresponding to 0 is exactly, you restrict down to this subgroup and you transfer up. That was exactly the first term in the double coset formula that I wrote up. The second term corresponding to the open interval is where you restrict in both of the variables to one lower group and then you transfer up from there. If you remember the double coset formula, the second term had a minus sign in front of it and that comes from the fact that the internal Euler characteristic of the open interval is minus 1. That's this term. After all, the Euler characteristic was defined as the Euler characteristic of the closure inside of the double coset space, so the Euler characteristic of 0, 1, minus the Euler characteristic of the topological boundary, which is just 0, 1. And that means it's 1 minus 2, so this is minus 1. So that explains the minus sign in the double coset formula in the middle term. And then the third term is very much like the first term. There you're restricting down you're not restricting in the second copy of ON, you're restricting one down in the first copy and then you transfer up from there. So this completes the proof of the double coset formula that will be relevant for the splitting in the case of the orthogonal groups. The splitting for orthogonal groups takes the following form. Let f be a global functor. And n greater equal to 1. Then the restriction homomorphism from O of n to O of n minus 1 from the value at O n to the value at O n minus 1 is a naturally split epimorphism.
as in the case of the symmetric groups, the naturality refers to F, so this, this splitting is natural for all morphisms of global functors in F. Here's the proof. Well, we're going to mimic Doyle's argument for the symmetric groups. It's going to be very roughly the same. It's going to be a little bit more complicated because the double coset formula doesn't quite work out in exactly the same way. But we make the same definitions as before. We set f of O semicolon k to be the kernel of the restriction map from O of k to O of k minus 1. And the convention is that f of O comma 0 is just the value of the trivial group. In this situation, f of O semicolon 1 will typically be non-zero because the orthogonal group O of 1 is non-trivial. And then we construct an isomorphism, a natural isomorphism. Again, sum over terms, psi and k, from the direct sum, k equals 0 up to n, f of O semicolon k to the value at O n. And the definitions of this psi case is the obvious analog of what we did in the symmetric group case, psi k n, is the following composite. We start from f of O semicolon k, which includes into the value of O of k, it's defined as a subgroup after all, then we do an inflation p k n minus k up a star to the value at O of k cross O of n minus k. And again, p k n minus k refers to the projection of this product to the first factor, and we're inflating along that. And then we're doing transfer k O n minus k to f of O n. And now this refers to the transfer, considering this as the block sum subgroup inside of here. And then again, we need this key relation, same as in the symmetric group case. We need to know that when we restrict from O n to O n minus 1, after having done the psi k comma n, this gives us the psi k comma n minus 1. So instead of symmetric groups, we have orthogonal groups, but otherwise it's exactly the same relation. We will prove this again by taking the double coset formula that I just established on the previous whiteboard and pre-compose it with the composite first, the inclusion, and then this. So pre-compose the double coset formula with P, K, N minus K upper star after the inclusion going from f of o semicolon of k to f of o of k cross o of n minus k. Now the double coset formula has three terms and so the argument diverges at this point. This expresses the restriction from o n to o n minus 1 after psi k n as the sum of three terms. In the symmetric group case, we only had two terms. The analysis of what is now the first and the last term, which were the only two terms in the symmetric group case, is the same. So the first term in the double coset formula, pre-composed with this, exactly leads to psi k n minus 1. So the last term of the double coset formula pre-composed with this again leads to zero. And now the additional argument we have to make is that also the second term, which generically will be a non-zero transfer, becomes zero when we pre-compose it with this. But that is also easy because the second term in particular involves well a transfer, but then it involves restriction from O of K cross O of n minus k, and then go down by 1 in both of the factors to O of k cross O of n minus k minus 1. 
Um, and then there was also a transfer, but that's not even going to be relevant. And then we post pre-compose with OK and minus K upper star and then the inclusion. Now again, it's an instance of functoriality for restrictions. This was a projection to the first factor, and then we're restricting down in the first factor and in the second factor. So this is going to be, again, a projection, but now the indices drop in both of them. This, this composite of the first two is p k minus 1, comma n minus k minus 1 upper star. And then we have to precompose restriction from O of k to O of k minus 1. And then we have to precompose with the inclusion again. But now the same argument kicks in that was also available for showing that the other, the third term vanishes. You know, here we have the inclusion of what's the kernel of the restriction map and then the restriction map. So this composite is zero by definition and hence the whole term is zero and it remains zero if you also compose with another transfer. So that shows that while the second term in the double coset formula is generically a non-trivial term, it becomes zero when we pre-compose with this and that proves the claim. From this point onwards, the proof is exactly the same as in the finite group case for fin global functors and for symmetric groups. It's the inductive argument by using the same exact sequences to compare them. So from now on, there is no uh, moderation necessary anymore, and this completes the proof. As I mentioned a number of times, there's an analogous splitting for the values of global functors at unitary and symplectic groups. And the argument is essentially the same. In the unitary and symplectic case, it's even a tiny little bit easier because the double coset formula comes out in exactly the same way with three terms. But for the unitary and the symplectic groups, the middle term, the one which came from the open interval and which had the minus sign in front of it, that term is actually zero because it's a transfer along a subgroup with an infinite value. The difference between the orthogonal case on the one hand and the unitary and symplectic cases on the other hand ultimately comes from the fact that O of 1 is a finite group, while its U of 1 and SP of 1 have positive dimensions, and that leads to infinite while group and vanishing of one of the terms. I would like to close the lecture by commenting a little bit on what happens for special orthogonal and special unitary groups. The short answer is that the splittings do not work in exactly the same way. Uh, I will be a little bit more detailed about this. These are sort of the analogs of alternating versus symmetric groups, and at the beginning of the lecture I already gave you an example why Dolce splitting and Nakaoka splitting do not work for alternating groups. So let me first deal with the special unitary groups. And here the simple answer is that it essentially never works. The restriction from f of s u n to f of s u n minus 1, restriction s u n, s u n minus 1, is not generally subjective. For n greater equal to 3, So the case n equals 2 is sort of trivial because SU1 is a trivial group. And of course, restriction to the trivial group always has a splitting. But as soon as you are n equals 3, then there is no, in particular, no natural splitting because there are examples where this is not subjective. You know, of course, when I'm saying it's not generally subjective, there might be specific global functors f for which this is subjective or split subjective, but there's no general splitting here. In the paper, I give you explicit witnesses of this. For n equals 3, I'm going to use mod 2 cohomology. And for n4 and larger, I'm, I'm using the representation ring global functor to give you an explicit witness, an explicit example of an f for which this is not subjective. Let me also comment on the special orthogonal groups, because there, there is actually a splitting in half of the cases. But this is sort of not a new result, um, it's a consequence of the splitting for the orthogonal groups. So here we sort of have to distinguish whether you restrict from an 
odd orthogonal group to an even one or from an even to an odd one. So let's first look at the case where you restrict from odd to even and the first observation is the restriction from the cohomology of B S O 2 M plus 1 with F2 coefficients down to the cohomology of B S O 2 M with mod 2 coefficients does not admit a section compatible with the action of this denote algebra. So this map is actually subjective, and because these are all F2 vector spaces, there is of course a splitting as F2 vector spaces, but not compatible with the Steenot algebra action. And this basically follows from two things, uh, B, S, O, N, with F2 coefficients. You know, without the S, the cohomology of B, O, N is polynomial on the stiefel whitney classes, and when you pass to S O N, the first stiefel whitney class is not present, so this is a polynomial algebra over F2 on the stiefel whitney classes all the way from W2 to WN. And then a special thing happens when N is odd, then square 1 on the stiefel whitney class 2M is actually the stiefel whitney class in the next higher dimension. But the stiefel whitney class 2m plus 1 goes to 0 under this action, and then there is no section compatible with the action of the Steenot algebra. Why does this show that there cannot be a natural splitting of global functors? Well, as I'll explain in the next lecture, if there was a natural splitting of global functors, then the global classifying spaces uh, would split in the global stable homotopy category. By forgetting to the non equivalent stable homotopy category, you would get a splitting of the suspension spectrum of B S O 2 M plus 1 splitting off this sum end, and this cannot be because there is no section compatible with the action of this denote algebra. So this takes care of half of the cases for the special orthogonal groups, and in the other parity there actually is a splitting, but it's not really new mathematics as I'll now explain, it's a consequence of the splitting that we already had, and it all comes from the fact that the orthogonal group O 2 M plus 1 is actually isomorphic as a group to plus minus 1 cross SO to N plus 1. So the isomorphism sends an epsilon comma A to epsilon times A. So you take the matrix and you do scalar multiplication by epsilon. And here it is important that we're in odd dimensions because then the matrix with minus 1 all on the diagonals has determinant minus 1. Otherwise it would have determinant plus 1 and this wouldn't work. So this is the splitting of groups, and that means we can now look at the following diagram. We look at the value of the global functor on O to M. Here we have the restriction from O to M to O to M minus 1. This goes to F evaluated at O of 2 M minus 1. Now we compare with the special orthogonal groups. So here we restrict from O to M SO 2M, F at SO 2M, and here's another restriction from SO 2M to SO 2M minus 1 to F at SO 2M minus 1, and one more restriction here. So now, as I explained before, this has a natural splitting. This map is one of the instances where the group here is actually a product of this group and plus minus one. So of course this projection, at the group level there's a section and inflation along the section gives you a natural splitting here. And that means we take this splitting, then this splitting, and then we go down to all together. This gives us, and even in a constructive way, this gives us a natural splitting down here. So in half of the special orthogonal cases, this splitting basically has as a formal consequence a splitting down here, and the other half of the cases it does not work. This is all I was planning to explain today. In the next lecture, I will give you a bunch of examples of the splittings. On the one hand, I will show you that the splittings imply stable global splittings of the global classifying spaces. 
The underlying non-equivalent splittings that you get from this were known for a long time, but the global results are new. Another application that I will explain in the next lecture is that the splitting results ensure that certain long exact homotopy group sequences of global spectra actually decompose into short exact sequences. And when we apply this to the global tone spectra, capital M, capital O, and capital M, capital U, in the end we'll get regularity results for certain Euler classes. This is all for today. Thank you for your attention.